So thank you for coming to our talk about uh, building Apache Druid on Kubernetes or the Emotion Service Pattern Data. So first, there won't be any line of YAML in this presentation. So you can get out now if that's what you came for. And also, we're going to talk about what we are putting in our Kubernetes, what workload we are running. So maybe not the best plan in, in uh, KubeCon. So I'm uh, Alex Triquet. I work at Dailymotion as a senior DevOps engineer. And, and I'm Cyril Corbon. I'm DevOps architect uh, at Dailymotion. So at Dailymotion, uh, we are the DevOps team. And we are building Kubernetes platform over uh, different cloud providers and uh, on-premise. We are also helping developers to uh, to set in productions all their workloads. That means we use to deploy the CICDs and to enforce best practices for them. And uh, we are we are also uh, using we are also doing all the on-call stuff. At Daily Motion, uh, we are a company that build video platform. If you don't know us, uh, we have like four billion views per month, and uh, we have two main projects, so the dailymotion.com uh, service, that is our main platform, and uh, a network of partners with uh, an advertising platforms for other customers. And we serve all the metrics and all the partners that us through Druid, and we will talk about that in this presentation. So yes, uh, I introduced to you uh, what Apache Druid is, but first, uh, does anyone here run any Druid? Quick show of hands, please. Really? <laughs> oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> Great. Uh, so uh, basically, what Druid is, is a, it's a database. Uh, you use it to for analytics capacities. It's uh, all up. Uh, you want to use it for time series and has uh, a lot of benefits like time series. And <laughs> and a columnar data, it's a columnar database also. So plenty of exciting capacities. Um, the way here we have a presentation of the architecture. Uh, it's uh, pretty complex. Uh, there are different ways uh, to run it. Uh, basically, let's take a top-down approach. You have your query nodes uh, at the top here, uh, which are with what we will interact. Basically, they handle all the routing, all the queries that are made to the historicals that are the nodes that will serve the data. The indexer have the room the mirror walls of the historicals in that they ingest the data into your clusters to be served by the historicals. Uh, underneath, we have a layer of deep storage. We are running on, well, S3 protocol at uh, our CSP. And uh, on the side, you have uh, the control plan, which is uh, actually fairly complex because here we can see Apache Zookeeper, uh, metadata storage, uh, actually. It's a database. We are running some MySQL. And uh, you have some other Druid nodes that handle all the um, persistence of the data, all the balancing, so that all your historicals are in uh, synchronization. Um, now I'll explain to you how a query works with uh, Druid. So basically, we have a scatter gather uh, approach. So when a request is made to the broker, it will scatter this query to all the historicals. That will uh, each uh, execute a partial query and then send back the data to be the, result, the partial results to be aggregated uh, as a gather part at the broker. Uh, it has uh, it's felt nice because <laughs> because actually uh, if you have good patterns, you can have all the RAM intensive stuff in your historicals and just ends up doing reconciliation almost on uh, your brokers, which is very efficient since all your uh, historicals are built with a lot of RAM to be able to serve data very efficiently. Um, thank you. Um, so why use Druid? Um, basically, I've listed you the, the pros, but really the big, the, the big thing here is the ability to do all app on time series. It's rather unique. You can do that with other stuff, but not as well. And also, you can do it in uh, with uh, columnar data. So it's well, it's a standard in terms of OLAP. So this way, you can just add in other other columns as much as you want, and never have to think about your schema or what you're using, as long as you aggregate uh, the data. Uh, it's easy to scale because actually you can scale horizontally 
uh, all your nodes. You can increase the number of nodes. Um, you can just increase the storage if you if that's just what you need. So very powerful on, on this. And yeah, also documentation is great, uh, which ties into a big uh, a big cons here. It's that uh, the configuration is pretty complex. Once you have your setup up and running, uh, up and running, you will need to do quite a bit of tuning with your values. And you need to adapt it to all your use cases to really make the best out of what you have. O otherwise, you can just throw more RAM at the problem. It will eventually work, but it's not exactly why we are here for. And uh, yes, uh, as I mentioned, the, complex is, uh, the setup is pretty complex. Uh, we, we, cure, we have a lot of moving parts. And uh, our Druid run like five different nodes, the dif different type of nodes. So that can be a bit of a hassle. When you're doing a, ro a rollout, you need to make sure that everything is in the right order, those kind of things. And finally, uh, you need to need it. <laughs> because that's something that's pretty unique and that's only adapted for a bunch of use cases. Use cases that are fairly spread. Uh, mostly I'm thinking about statistics here. Uh, it's very powerful for that, especially since we are using a lot of approximate counts uh, to, to, to save on group buys, uh, this kind of queries, which makes it uh, very fast. Um, yeah, now I'm going to briefly present to you uh, the Druid UI. I'm not sure we, we can see it quite right. Uh, we have some color problems. Uh, but basically, this is a standard SQL, uh, SQL query. Uh, you can interact with Druid by using uh, native Druid query language, which looks like, which is a bunch of JSON, where you list all the operations you need and in which order. Uh, or you can use uh, SQL, and we have a translation engine. Uh, here, it works fairly well, especially with the la la latest version, but you always run the risk to to have inefficient queries because we are on uh, fairly specific data patterns, so specific queries run best here. And uh, yeah, also I didn't mention uh, you have two kinds of, uh, well, you have three kinds of fields in Druid. You have uh, your timestamp, so that will be your primary aggregation uh, means. Uh, yeah, that is unique, and also you'll have dimensions, which are basically strings and can even be arrays, not something we are using. I, th I think it's then dangerous, to be honest. And uh, you also, I, I don't have any here, but uh, you have floats for all your aggregation, for all the stats you want to be, you want to be serving, that will be your, your metrics. Uh, also, I wanted to mention, so yeah, let's talk about ingestion. Uh, we usually ingest data hourly uh, and daily. Uh, basically, the data is reconciled at the end of the day. It's standard business practice for uh, advertising data. So some, some things are uh, just done about everywhere. And uh, we have usually uh, data freshness of uh, a bit less than two hours. Like once uh, an event happens, two hours afterwards, it is uh, counted in our Druid uh, cluster. Uh, we use Apache Airflow for that, so it's an orchestrator. I'm sure a bunch of you are familiar with, the, with it. Um, it runs quite well. Uh, the only problem we have is when we want to run very heavy tasks, so when we are backfilling an entire table. It's called, it's called data source in Druid, but it's a table, basically. Um, it can take uh, some days. It can be very cumbersome. Uh, it can kill the cluster, basically. So what we are doing is that we are popping um, Hadoop clusters uh, it's, we use it as a SaaS and it runs well. It's not my favorite part of it, to, to, to be honest. I, I would advise against doing it. You can find other patterns, especially with latest version of Druid, but well, legacy is legacy. So now we are going to talk about how we set up our Druid on Kubernetes. Uh, just to know, are you running uh, stateful workloads on your, on your Kubernetes clusters? Okay, we got some, okay. In production? Yes, okay. So that's nice. Uh, just a brief uh, recap. Uh, for no, some people that don't know operators, uh, the goal of the operators is to have a declarative state and uh, to have all the logic on the operator. You will reconcile the state and apply the resources. Each time you change the state, it will reconcile, apply the change, and report the status. That's uh, how it works almost all the case. Um, we have some use cases at Dailymotion, and we are running a lot of operators. 
these are the main use cases uh, we tackle. So we have data management, database management, application monitoring, application uh, deployment, monitoring and logging, machine learning, and infrastructure management. Um, we use, uh, with Druid, some other operators like Set Manager to provide certificates and, uh, ingress, uh, and on ingresses. And uh, we are using other operators, such as logging operator, uh, to manage our FreeND and FreeND bits dynamically. For Druid operator, it's a single, uh, just to know, uh, just a point. Uh, recently, we forked the repo with the maintainers. Uh, it's now maintained on this GitHub repository, not on the Druid operator, the old one. Um, for Apache reasons, they don't have any maintainers currently working on the project, uh, but uh, others people do. Um, it's containing one on, and only one CRD for the moment, that is Druid clusters. And uh, the CRD is deploying a clusters with se several type, uh, type of nodes uh, that uh, we have presented. And uh, so the routers, middle managers, coordinators, historical brokers, uh, basically, it's by default all stateful sets, but it's uh, also, uh, you can change the kind uh, depending on the, dip on the type of nodes. So for example, in our, UK, uh, in our use case, we have only the historicals that are stateful. Um, and that it was the operator. The goal of these operators is to uh, do these features. So a uh, rolling deploy, that means when you made a changement, um, modification of the configuration uh, on any Druid object, on any part of CRD, it will redeploy the cluster on the good way. That means in an order, we will talk a bit later about it, but uh, with the historical first and the other nodes, uh, part, by, part by part. Then uh, it provides auto-scaling and HPA on all the components. Also volume expansion that's useful for historicals without any description. Uh, we can, we didn't use it, but uh, we can manage our phone's PVC and delete uh, PVCs of the stateful set if they are living. And uh, a feature that we really want to use is sharing management. That means uh, you can create several historical nodes and serve different types of data in uh, this uh, historical. That's really interesting and the operator is doing it pretty well. Yes, yeah. yeah, so basically what, what happened is uh, we had a legacy cluster uh, by Druid. Um, uh, it, was, it started as a POC. Uh, it ended up in production, but it was still kind of a POC, sort of. Also, it mostly it was working. Uh, it was kind of reliable, I'd say. Uh, but the main issue was that we didn't knew what we wanted to do with it. So basically we provided this to the data engineers and they had fun with it. So we ended up scaling a lot in terms of uh, storage. We didn't, uh, we didn't think we would have that much so stuff like this. And so after about uh, two years, we ended up with an old version because we had never made the effort to update and a bunch of needs uh, that had changed. So it was time to do our refactorization or re-architecture even. Um, we got rid of TidyB. I really like TidyB, it's a good product. But the problem is uh, we used it on our cluster. We run on a CSP as a database in cluster and it w didn't really suit our need because uh, it's good for performances, stuff like this. But what we needed was simplicity. Uh, basically, all you need is uh, MySQL to do or well, Postgres to do, to do meta meta data data. So in the end, we ended up cutting it, but we are pretty happy about the, the experience we earned on it, and we intend to reuse it on other, other projects. And also, yes, uh, we had a lot of pain points, uh, mostly the rollout, like it took 28 hours, we couldn't do any operations on our node pools, it was very complicated, so the main goal was to change the, 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 this fact. We were using local SSD, which is good for the price, uh, very good performance uh, for the price, but it wasn't satisfying enough. Uh, in, in the end, we calculated that we saved a lot of money by switching to PVC, which are twice as expensive, but just the time, the engineering time saved was massive. 
Um, uh, so how we did that is that we used GitOps through Flux City, uh, which is something we use uh, very widely. Uh, basically, we have moved about two thirds of our projects to Flux City, and all new projects are on it, obviously. And we intend to be done by the end of the year, I'd say. Um, so yes, uh, th that was what we why we needed to to change uh, all of that. Also, the deployment was manual. Uh, it was really a bunch of legacy that was left to rot in a corner, and so we needed to take back the ownership uh, of our stacks. So that's why we did this mission, and basically the point was to build a brand new Druid cluster that was in phase with uh, our needs, and as that enforced be best practice, and also that would cost less, because we were using big machines with uh, uh, with uh, 128 uh, gigabytes of RAM and, well, money to save. Yes, and uh, we, we, are, we are going to talk about uh, this. Uh, this is the, no, the current state of our Druid clusters. So uh, we have uh, the standard node pool with uh, all the main pods, so the coordinators, the routers, the brokers, and uh, the external part of the Druid operator, I would like to remind that Zookeeper and MancacheD are not deployed with the operator, that M shards that are deployed separately. Uh, even the ingress controller is not managed by the operator, it just deploys uh, the, um, the operator, just deploys an ingress. Uh, so we have this on a separate node pool. We have a node pool uh, dedicated to the exposition of the service with uh, an ingress and uh, an ingress controller and uh, an Go application that serves the, the API and uh, all our statistics and that queries the read. And we have then the stateful nodes, so the historicals. They are um, pretty huge uh, in memory utilization and on storage. We have like, uh, if I remember correctly, it was one tera, uh, one tera, more than one tera octet by pods. Uh, of PVCs, and uh, uh, we have a uh, 80 g uh, oh, no, we have 50 gigabytes of memory for each pod. Uh, these workloads are very memory intensive, and that's a, a point uh, of Druid, and that's why we do that. We have a part of our Druid historicals to reduce cost that are uh, in spot instance, and uh, the because uh, the Druid cluster when it kill uh, an historical. Uh, just uh, does not return the queries that are running and it's retrying on other nodes and we have a replication factor uh, at two so uh, we can uh, backport the query on other nodes automatically and that saves us a lot of money. That's almost everything for this spot. Yes, so uh, as I said, we wanted to save money, we wanted to improve performances, so what we needed was benchmarking. What we did was obviously made a test, uh, uh, set test of requests, so you, ha you have the number of seconds to run the whole test here. As uh, smaller is better, and obviously the yellow one, I guess it's yellow here, uh, is uh, the old one. And um, what we did was we created uh, two sets for a benchmark, basically uh, one test to test uh, all the limit, the edge cases, uh, basically recovering all the data in the cluster, trying to break it. It allowed us to test uh, resiliency as well as uh, performances in this context, which is not really con con conducive of real real usage and also using real uh, real request uh, taken for from production so we ended up with the with this test uh, we have more fine grained uh, results but those are the, as a summary um, we tested a bunch of configuration uh, one interesting stuff that we that we did was we mimicked what we had so basically we had local SSDs and instead of replacing four local SSDs with one PVC we replaced each time uh, one local SSD with one PVC uh, to ensure good performances and we we saw very very important differences when using more PVCs and it cost exactly the same so it was really almost a hack pretty happy about that uh, also, we tried uh, remote caching, so we used to have uh, caching on our Druid, but caching is very good for Druid because, as I mentioned earlier, you have all those states for your queries, so you can have uh, query results, partial query, query results, or even uh, data caching with segments on the historicals. They use the spare RAM to do that, so 
the more caching you have, the more efficiency uh, you can have, especially when you are serving traffic for statistics with often redundancy between your uh, requests. Everybody wants to see uh, the data from the last seven days, stuff like this on, on Monday. So yes, and uh, in the end, remote caching was very interesting in terms of performances. Uh, it was very easy to set up with memcached and uh, mchart, as Cyril mentioned. Uh, I really advise on adding caching when you can, to trying to do it. Uh, really, I, I think it's uh, it's neat. And yeah, so now I'll talk about the migration process. So this was the biggest headache, I, I'd say, with the configuration, because what we needed was um, no downtime. So we need to do a double run of our clusters. The problem is we had uh, to have uh, concurrency between operators which were now the same version. So we had to cheat a bit. And what we did, we started by killing the old operators. Uh, when that was done, we still, our CRD, we still had our CRD in place with none of the control of the operator, but it was fine, especially with someone doing an operation on it. And uh, afterwards, we set up the new operator, all that with Flux CD, so everything was ready to roll out. It was really, really, easier with this uh, to, to, to perform this operation. Then comes <laughs> the even trickier part. So we scaled down some nodes, the ones that write uh, information in the database so that we were able to do a database migration because we wanted at the same time to change what we used. So we scaled down the nodes that write to the DBs that interact with it. Uh, we killed all the ingestion tasks. So that was our only downtime. We had a bit of less freshness on our data which is for our use cases perfectly fine. And uh, then we set up all the all we had with the new cluster. Ended up with, uh, yes, so, uh, and, and, uh, and so we, we migrated the database and in the end we just switched to the new cluster and we were able to kill the uh, old one after, after two days. So the so whole operation uh, took about uh, one hour to migrate about 13 ter 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 terabytes of data, which is nice, to be honest. And uh, we didn't have any downtime, and the most time consuming was actually dumping the database and restoring it. Um, I guess we could have made improvement on that, but we, we were happy about uh, the whole results of this. And now we'll talk about monitoring and exposition. Yep. <coughs> so for our use case, we are using Datadog, but uh, there is a lot of plugins, uh, so you can see all of them there. Uh, there are Open metrics, Prometheus, and StatsD uh, uh, plugins are available. And uh, we have uh, two ingresses so, uh, that we deploy one for the console that we showed before, and one for the API that is protected with MTLS. And we use Set Manager to provision it all the certificates uh, on our case. That's all we did. Uh, just uh, a point, uh, we also use uh, Datadog APM to uh, monitorize uh, all, the tra uh, all the traces, and uh, that's useful sometimes on Go API. Uh, we are going to talk how we git apps, uh, git, uh, Dread, sorry. Uh, that means how we deploy Dread in our cluster. So as uh, Alex said, uh, we are using uh, Flux CD in our case. Uh, that's working with two controllers, mainly the customized controllers and the M controllers, and with different kinds of sources. So in our case, we have GitHub sources and M, uh, and M repositories, and uh, we deployed several customization uh, to, uh, to in our clusters, and we are doing some tiering too. Uh, that means we have a first customization that this that is deploying all the CRD stuff and all the operators. Another one that deploy all the business namespace. One with the memcached and the zookeeper. And finally, the grid clusters. That's all us to stop the, to suspend the customization if we have to do a modification in production and then to backport if we have to back fix faster. And that uh, authorizes us also to have dependencies between our deployments. That's really nice and it works perfectly well. On uh, our common operations, uh, we talk about automatic rollout. That's a feature that the operator bring. 
that means when we we made a modification, uh, it will always roll out in this order. So that means if the historicals are impacted, so historicals will restart one by one or two by two, depending of, on uh, your update strategy. And then it will take the, in, uh, the, um, the overloads, the indexers, the real time parts, the coordinators, and the brokers. Another part is the storage update. Uh, in Druid, we want to add data sometimes and uh, metadata too. Uh, so we want to scale horizontally and vertically. Um, the operator provides a volume expansion uh, dynamically, and it works really well. Um, and another point is uh, recently, we had to migrate uh, from a CSI to another one, and uh, the operator uh, helped us a lot to, uh, in this case. Uh, that means um, when we are changing the configuration, only the CSI on the new STS state first uh, will change, and it will load the data one by one. So we don't have, with the, replicator, the replication factor, any uh, disruptance. So yes, we're going to give you as a feedback. As I said, everything we did was perfect. It was very nice. Congratulated, <laughs> we congratulated ourselves a lot. So well, no. <laughs> so we had a, a few issues. Uh, one of the issue we encountered is performances. So basically, we are using um, SQL uh, as it's uh, a part that is not uh, maintained a lot. We, we have a lot of changes of teams. And so we don't have a lot of uh, skills around using native queries right now. And the problem when you do that is that you don't have control over what is running on your clusters. And sometimes you end up with big inefficiencies, like you are running a bunch of group bytes, you are running aggregations of aggregations, while it's not done for that and you don't need that. So that's one of the points. Uh, in the end, we were able to make it do what we wanted by uh, playing a bit with the SQL by using the latest versions. We, which have a very good translation engine, to be honest. It's really getting there. So you can just use SQL, and if you have bad performances, rewrite your SQL to <laughs> adapt it to the, to the use case. And uh, we also had a lot of tweaking to do uh, about the Druid configuration. As I mentioned, there is a lot of good documentation where we'll explain what is default, how you should do your calculation, but you need to get in there and pull, pull your, your, calcula <laughs> your calculus uh, your Excel sheets and do a bunch of operations on how many threads will I need, how many buffers, which sizes, uh, what does it mean for my brokers, st stuff like this, which is something really that you, you, you can do a pretty good job um, on your own, but in the end you will need to test it to make sure that everything makes sense and that it runs properly. Also, uh, about the migration, we ended up with a big surprise in that uh, when we migrated all our data, we changed uh, the bucket we used underneath, and uh, we didn't, uh, we, we, we didn't, I didn't know actually that uh, in the database for all your data, you have the location, the bucket it uses. It's not needed because Druid knows where, w in which bucket to, to search for, but it's specified in there as well and we didn't change it. So we, we ended up with the staging not popping up, like data wasn't there. It <laughs> took us uh, uh, took us a bit of time to understand what was going on and we ended up uh, running for two weeks on two different buckets at the same time, which was very messy. So we had to do a second <laughs> migration and this time we were able to rectify uh, as well. And finally, we had some very, very strange uh, behavior, uh, which uh, by using uh, preemptible spot instances, we had uh, some very, very down to the machine problems that we weren't able to explain, but it was very hard to debug because uh, we are using J Java 8 and it's not done for Kubernetes. And so you're not able to monitor what it's doing with RAM, you can just give it a, a huge chunk of RAM and hope for the best, basically, which is a bit of, which is not the best because um, the more RAM you have on your Druid cluster, the better it operates. And especially with spare RAM, it can cache segments, stuff like this, and it gets, it gets a lot of benefits out of this. So we had a, a lot of issues uh, on this. Now we'll talk about all the improvements we see for our own clusters, but 
to be honest, it represents a bit of what is happening right now around Druid, I'd say. Yeah. Um, currently, we are planning to migrate to Druid 25 and uh, to migrate to Java 17 uh, because uh, we had some issues with uh, the Java 8 version currently. Uh, just to precise, uh, we got uh, all the RAM that is cached by the GVM but not usable by the Druid when we are running on Spot Instance. That's what's happened. Uh, then we have uh, some nodes uh, that are running on ARM and we are planning to decrease the cost to migrate all the Druid cluster on ARM, I think in the next quarter. We, are, we plan to uh, add a proxy SQL in front of uh, our SQL uh, engine and to run, uh, to run Druid without the Kuiper. That means we, we plan to use uh, the TCD and uh, the Kubernetes API uh, to get all the endpoints and all the information that we need. Uh, it's currently unstable, but we, uh, for, from the documentation, but we plan to test it uh, uh, on staging soon, and we hope to, to have this tackle in the next months too. Yes. And the long term? Oh. Um, I don't think we have any time, uh, actually, to talk about the, the long term. Uh, anyway, maybe we can f finish with a closing remark. Uh, it's that in the end, uh, what we are doing is running uh, stateful sets on Kubernetes and really taking advantage of it. Uh, I would understand very well that you wouldn't want to do that. But basically, it's, it's not something that would run better on bare metal, uh, in my opinion. So in the end, maybe it's not that well suited for Kubernetes, but what is it suited for in the end? Uh, we don't know, and so we think uh, no, but we, we think Kubernetes is the best really that can be done, even though it's not maybe that easy. And finally, we'd like to address a special thanks to the Druid and the Druid operator community, especially the maintainers, with whom we have worked a lot, and well, uh, thank you.